take me through your process of writing a biography. I mean, the the, the full of it, and not not just writing a biography, but understanding deeply, which your books have done for the human story and like the bigger ideas underlying the human story. So you've written biographies both of individuals, which are hardly individuals. Mm -hmm. It's a really big, complex picture. And biographies of ideas that involve individuals. Well, step one for me is trying to figure out how the mind works. Um, What causes Einstein to make that leap? Elon Musk to say stainless steel while he's looking at a carbon fiber rocket or... How do you make the mental leap? Because I write about smart people, but smart people are a dime a dozen. They don't usually amount to much. You have to be creative, imaginative, to think different, as Jobs would say. And so what makes people creative? What makes them take imaginative leaps? That's the key question you got to ask. You also ask the questions like you've asked earlier, which is what demons are jangling in their head and how do they harness them into drives? So you look at all that. And you try to observe really carefully uh, the person. Uh, One of the more mundane things I do is a lot of writers try to give you a lot of their opinions and preach or whatever. Uh, As I said, uh, this mentor said two people types come out, preachers, storytellers, (laughs) be a storyteller. I try, whenever I'm trying to convey a thought, there's six magic words that I almost should have written on a card penned above my desk, which is, let me tell you a story. So if somebody says, how does Elon Musk figure out good talent, as you did, I think, well, let me tell you the story. I'll tell you the story of Jake McKenzie. Mm Or this is not something I invented. I mean, this is why the good Lord does it in the Bible. I mean, has the best opening lead sentence ever, you know, in the beginning, comma, and then it's stories. And secondly, to pick up on that lead sentence in the beginning, make it chronological. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the 40th year of their life has grown from the 39th year and the 38th year. And so you want to show how people evolve and grow. I had the greatest of all nonfiction narrative editors, Alice Mayhew at Simon Schuster, who, among other things, created All the President's Men with Woodward and Bernstein. But she had a note she'd put in the margins of my books that was a ticta, and it meant all things in good time. Keep it chronological. If it's good enough for the Bible, it's good enough for you. Interesting. To me, like that's a small note. But to you, it's it's extremely important. Because it's the framework for how you structure things, but also how you understand things, which is if you keep it a chronological narrative, then you're showing how a person has grown from one experience you've to- talked about to the next one. And that moral growth, creative growth, risk-taking growth, wisdom, that's the essences of creativity, but you can't do it. Uh, you know, there's a term buildings Roman, you know, which is a, you know, book of, you know, that carries a narrative and tells how people learn something. I'm a big believer in narrative. If you're an academic, you sometimes, not today, but in like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there were two things you thought were bad. One was Uh, having a great person theory of history in which you decided to do biography. I had a great professor when I was in college. Her name was Doris Kearns. Mm -hmm. She later married Dick Goodwin. And she, when she was going for tenure at the university, wrote a biography of Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream. Mm -hmm. And they denied her tenure because it was beneath the dignity of the academy to write history through one person. Uh, that's great. It opened up the field of biography to us non-academics, uh, starting with David McCullough, Bob Caro, but maybe John Meacham and myself are in a new generation, and certainly there's a generation coming after us. 
But the second thing besides telling it through people, which is the academy tended to disdain what they called imposing a narrative Mm -hmm. and what you made it storytelling. Because that meant you were leaving things out and making it into a narrative. Well, that's how we form our views of the world. Well, let me ask you this question. In terms of gathering an understanding, how much of it is one observing and how much of it is interviews? Yeah, um, and obviously depends on the subject. I mean, with a Ben Franklin, it's all based on archives. And every, of course, we have 40 volumes of letters he wrote. That was the good old days when every day you'd write 20 letters. The Musk book is based much more on observation than almost any of my books because he opened up in a way that was breathtaking to me. You know, even when he'd be sitting playing polytopia or seething at other people, you know, he'd have me just sitting there watching. I mean, I spent a lot of time with Jennifer Dowden at her side. I went to her lab and edited a human gene and, you know, with a pipette and a test tube. But I would say I spent 30 hours with her. Mm-hmm. I can't count, you know, 100 hours or more just observing Musk. And I'm not sure that any biographer, perhaps since Boswell took on Dr. Johnson, has ever had quite as much up close, meaning five feet away at all times, access. And because of that, I'll go back to what I said a moment ago, I try to get out of the way of the story. Mm-hmm. It's not about me. It's not about, I try to just say, okay, here's what happened. Here's this story. Here's what happened the night he came in to Twitter for the first time. And let you form your own judgment. 